Good morning, everyone. My name is Ian Forrest. I'm visiting here from Toronto. Uh, very excited to be here. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Ian4 with two R's. I'm an engineering manager at Biblio Commons, a SaaS company that provides services to public libraries like St. Louis Public Library, Chicago Public Library, Boston, and many others. Uh, when you visit the library and search the catalog, place a hold on a book, register for an event, those are the kind of features that we provide. Uh, fun public library fact, we experience a traffic spike every year in the first week of January that goes back to normal after a couple of weeks. Um, I'm not sure how those New Year's resolutions are doing. Uh, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to web accessibility. I'm not going to have time to cover it all. My goal is to provide an overview of accessibility concepts to help put things into perspective and to provide recommendations for what you can be doing at your workplace and in your community. Gotta move my mouse over there. All right. All right. This is my dog, Willow. I always include her in my slides. She's a huge Cardinals fan. Um, <laughs> and since St. Louis is a National League city, she hates designated hitters. She also hates wearing hats. It was a difficult picture to take. Um, we're going to break this into four sections. First, some um, terminology. Uh, disability, what's a disability? A uh, physical, mental, cognitive, or developmental condition that limits a person's ability to engage in certain tasks or participate in typical daily activities. Uh, note the word typical. This is key. So a disability is contextual. Uh, for example, a person with a seizure disorder might not identify as having a disability if they um, can depend on public transportation and it's under control. But the same person in a rural area who needs, who can't have their driver's license anymore might identify as having a disability. Uh, it also changes over time, so we develop disabilities as we age, if we have an accident, if we develop a health condition, how many of us have parents or grandparents who need to zoom their browsers or, or use hearing aids. And it can also go the other way. For example, some health conditions like seizure disorders or, or mental illness can improve with medication or therapy. Uh, assistive technology. My definition here is tools that help people perform tasks that might otherwise prove challenging or impossible. Um, there's a lot of examples, um, a wheelchair, uh, a white cane, which is something that a person with vision disabilities would use to detect if there's stuff in, in front of them, hearing aids, screen magnification software, screen readers, which is software that helps people with vision disabilities use computers. Examples would include JAWS, VoiceOver, or NVDA. Speech input software like Dragon Naturally Speaking or even Siri. Uh, and there's lots of other tools for people with motor disabilities. So if we take a look at this link. Come on, internet. There we go. Um, we have, I'm going to zoom in a little bit so people can see. Uh, mouse sticks and head wands for people with physical disabilities. We got switches. There's uh, special keyboards for people with dexterity issues who find it difficult to use like regular keyboards. Uh, there's all sorts. Um, A11Y stands for accessibility. There's 11 characters between the A and the Y. Uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, is the accessibility legislation in the US. Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG, defines how to make the web more accessible to people with disabilities. You might see 2.0 out there, but 2.0, or sorry, 2.1 is the current version, and it's been out for some time. It has more for mobile, low vision, and cognitive accessibilities. And ARIA is a tool at your disposal to help you meet WCAG standards. Some example attributes might be like ARIA hidden or ARIA labeled by. It shouldn't be your first tool of choice. You should be using HTML elements to their semantic specifications uh, first. For example, don't use something like div class equals button. Divs aren't focusable by default, so use a button and style them. Now we're going to talk about why this is important. In our physical spaces, uh, there are a lot of affordances which help exist to uh, help people with disabilities. So we can think of wheelchair ramps, stair railings, buttons to open doors. We all use these and we take them for granted, but it wasn't always the case. It wasn't that long ago that most of this infrastructure didn't exist. 
So in Toronto, our subway stations built in the 60s, which isn't that long ago, they're retrofitting elevators right now, which is a very slow and expensive process. In general, people with disabilities were not valued. There was a strong disability movement in the 60s and 70s. Uh, Ed Roberts was uh, the first student with severe disabilities at UC Berkeley. And thanks to the work of him and others, uh, public opinion starts shifting. Hooray! But we still have problems. The world was not built for people with disabilities. So here I'm showing a photo of a wheelchair at a curb with a five inch drop. And if they keep moving forwards, they're going to fall over. So we invented curb cuts. Uh, and other things like basic human decency, which is still a work in progress. But here I'm showing a picture of a wheelchair rider at a curb cut. Today, many people don't realize that curb cuts were designed for wheelchair riders. People assume that they exist to help with strollers, with luggage, with bull carts. It just kind of makes sense for them to be there. That's what the curb cut effect is. The idea that improvements that we make for users with disabilities end up making things better for everybody. And while this is like nice, um, it's important to remember while these affordances are nice to have for people without disabilities, that they're essential for people with disabilities. For more on curb cuts and their history and influence, you should check out this uh, podcast, 99% Invisible. They have an episode called Curb Cuts. I highly recommend giving that a listen. It was more background on, on it, Ed Roberts and, and curb cuts and all that. And another thing in that last picture, with, the, with curb cuts, they helped one group of people, wheelchair riders, but they introduced a problem for another group. So without curb cuts, people with vision disabilities who are using white canes could tell that they were leaving the sidewalk. But with curb cuts, it causes a problem for them. So now they frequently feature a second accessibility affordance called Tenji blocks or tactile paving, which signals to people with vision disabilities who are using a cane that they're leaving the sidewalk or near danger, like at the edge of a train platform. But we're, we're still not perfect. This is a recent photo of an intersection in Brooklyn where a wheelchair rider is at an intersection with no curb cuts and is visibly frustrated for good reason. This is what it means for them. This is the, the distance that they have to travel versus the distance that a person who can walk across the intersection on the di diagonal has to travel. Um, this is also assuming that every nearby intersection has curb cuts. It's really just terrible. Uh, on a similar note, in St. Louis, we have these scooters everywhere. Um, they're like a plague. I've, I've never, this is new to me. Uh, I'm showing a picture of an electric scooter parked right in front of a curb cut in St. Louis. It's not the only one that I found like this while I was walking around downtown earlier this week. They're everywhere. This is going to block wheelchair riders from using this intersection. And it's also just in like everybody's way. Uh, I get that they can help some people get around, but they should shouldn't leave them around like this. There's docks or something might be nice. Uh, ironically, it was very close to a street called Locust Street. So today we're in the midst of a similar push for disability rights, this time in our digital spaces. The legislation exists, the standards exist, the fight now is on the value that software companies place on people with disabilities. So now that we've looked at some accessibility history, we're going to look at how to improve the accessibility of your website. I'm not going to be mentioning WCAG very much. It's really valuable, but it's best to focus on concepts first and then look at the exact requirements that you need to meet after you know the concepts. One second. Okay, so where's the best place to start? Your keyboard. Uh, making sure that your website works with a keyboard is really good, and it's also going to be a good litmus test for other types of assistive technology. We want users to be able to tap through your pages in a logical order, generally left to right, top to bottom, and that they can tell where they are. Browsers will show focus outlines on elements that you can interact with by default, like links, buttons, and form elements. So let's start off with some bad examples. Come on, internet, again. All right, so I'm just going to start tabbing. And we can see where we are, there's blue focus outlines. The first thing that's a little odd is that the pagination here uh, goes to the right arrow first, and then it goes to the, the numbers. It's not that big of a deal, but something to note. Then I'm on the, the jacket cover, the title, place hold, goes down to the second item checkbox, then back to the first item, add author alert, the second item, uh, jacket cover, 
then add author alert for the second button, it's the second search result, and then it goes through all of the add author alerts. Um, and then it goes back to the second item's title, and then to the place a hold button for it, and then sort of normal ish again. You can imagine if uh, you have vision disabilities and you can't see the screen, how confusing this order would be. Uh, once we get to the bottom of the page, how many do we got? 12 results. We get to the pagination. Then it takes you up to the header, which is probably one of the first things that you would want to tab to when the page loads. Uh, it doesn't take you to the login, my account, my lists links. And then we scroll through the filters on the sidebar. There's lots of them, which is fine. And then it takes us back to uh, more links that are in the search results. So they're just kind of like spread out all over the page. And it's a very confusing experience. Another example, St. Louis Blues website. Uh, so congratulations on winning the Stanley Cup St. Louis. But uh, your website's not going to win accessibility awards. <laughs> uh, I'm tabbing through it right now. Uh, the first few, I couldn't tell where I was. Now we can kind of see that I'm on the 2019 Stanley Cup champions text, then the enterprise logo, and then I'm lost again. I assume that I'm in the header navigation. Eventually, I see, OK, so I'm in the, the scores. And then I'm just kind of bouncing all over the place. Again, a very confusing experience. What's happening here is that if we, I can't really like zoom here, but if you inspect the element and you look what they're doing, they're actively suppressing the focus outline. Um, so outline zero or outline none, it's a very bad idea. It, it's so bad that it has its own website called outlinenone.com. Um, I'd recommend going there, taking a look at that. But this makes your sites very unusable for a large variety of users. People with motor impairments that rely on assistive technology like mouth sticks, people with repetitive strain injuries who use speech input software, a lot of different types of people just don't do it. Uh, let's look at a better example. Here's uh, St. Louis Public Library's search. The first thing you're gonna notice is that, the first thing I do is I hit tab, I come to these links that weren't there before. These are called skip links, and they're basically links that are, are in the tab order, but they're off screen. Uh, screen reader users who are going through your page and they can't see the screen, it's the first thing that they're gonna interact with, and it allows them to skip to certain areas of the page. And also, uh, users with vision, like no vision issues, who are using other assistive technology can use this as shortcuts to get around your page if they can't use their mouse. I'm going to skip to content. It's just like a regular anchor on a page. It's pretty basic. And yeah, just tapping through the page, going through the sidebar. These ones are all, all the links and buttons are working in order. It's pretty straightforward. You get this for free by just doing literally nothing. Um, <laughs> uh, another slightly more advanced example Zoom in a little bit here also. Skip to content. Something that happens on websites that have a little bit more interactive elements, um, say an overlay, is you need to programmatically manage your focus. So here I'm going to click on an event, with my keyboard, and an overlay pops up. And what happens sometimes if you don't move uh, focus explicitly with JavaScript to within the overlay, what happens is you get stuck behind the overlay. So if, if you can't see, if you're using a screen reader, you're not even gonna know that this is here. You're, you're still gonna be tabbing through the search results. In this case, um, it works. You're, we're trapped in the, in the overlay. I'm gonna tab through the items. Get to the close button. Now you can, you can see that I'm tapping through like the Chrome tabs at the top. So I can't get out and go behind the overlay, which is great. I'm gonna close it and I move right back to where I was. That's also something that you have to do programmatically is remember where they were before and then move them back exactly where they were afterwards. This is some sample CSS for those skip links. 
So you just give your link a class, it moves it off screen, and then whenever it receives focus, it puts it in the top left corner. Um, but we, as Biblical Commons, we've come a long way. This is a JIRA ticket that came in from a library a few years ago where they logged a bug and said that in Firefox, probably other browsers, the active element in the CMS is outlined in blue. Can we hide this? And we went ahead and we did that. Um, so we've learned a lot since then. Focus outlines are a default feature in all web browsers. They're an example of a, like a digital curb cut. They're helpful for everybody. For example, when you're tabbing through a form, it's useful for everybody to know what input you're on. So as you start typing, you know that you're entering your email or your password or whatever. And removing them is like a reverse curb cut effect. Another one uh, sort of like underlines. It's not, there's kind of like a gray area on this. People can like argue that uh, people are used to the titles being linked, so maybe you don't need it there. Um, same with these checkboxes, perhaps, but these ones are confusing because for people who aren't colorblind, like color is often used as an indicator for links. These ones are blue, but they're not links, uh, except the author is a link. It's sort of an Easter egg, uh, but the author label isn't. So again, it's, it's just a little bit confusing. Um, if you're going to remove the underlines, be like intentional about it and make sure that there's other affordances so that people can tell what's a link and what's not. So I made up this quote. I don't like the way curb cuts look, so let's remove them to make our intersections more aesthetically pleasing. Um, it just sounds ridiculous, right? So this is a person who doesn't know what curb cuts are for or a developer who uses div class equals button. If you want a button, use a button and style it. It's a designer that wants to remove all underlines from their links without adding other affordances, or it's us in that last bug fix. And it sounds funny, but things like that still happen in physical spaces. David Lepofsky is a prominent figure in the accessibility community in Ontario, and he's one of the funniest speakers that I've had the pleasure to see. He has a video describing accessibility problems at Ryerson University's New, one of new, their new buildings in Toronto. I'll show some screenshots for it. And he also retweets everything with the hashtag AODA fail, which is the Ontario equivalent of the ADA. So I did a quick check for ADA fails on Twitter. Uh, here is one. When the federal government doesn't follow federal government policy, do you report it to the federal government? And there's a post office box like right in the middle of the sidewalk. Another one, uh, this one has the tactile paving on only half of the sidewalk. So if a blind user is walking with their white cane, they might not be able to tell, and they might just walk right into traffic. Here um, is a screenshot from his video. Uh, he's blind, and people with vision disabilities will use hand railings to help guide them up the stairs. So he found this rail, and he was climbing the stairs, and he ran into this pillar, and he found his way around it and found the railing again and it loops around and takes him back down the stairs. Um, another issue here, which isn't noted, is that the hand railing, the way that it is like, held there, it's very sharp on the bottom, so if you're using it to guide your way up the stairs, you could like, cut or hurt your hand. And here's another one. Um, the main entrance is so difficult to use that they added an accessibility entrance for a brand new building. Uh, and there's an angled pillar right outside of it. So he is leaving the building. He's using his white cane to see if there's something in front of him. And at his feet, there's not. But at his head level, there is because the pillar is angled and he ends up hitting his head. <sighs> OK. Uh, moving on, next, alt text and screen reader text. The goal here is that screen readers can understand the active element on your page. Alt text, many images on your page are going to be decorative, meaning that they don't add information to your page that's already there. So all images need alt attributes, but they don't all need alt text. You can give them alt equals empty string, and then assistive technology will know that this image is decorative and not to announce it to, to users. Also repetition, it can be confusing and frustrating to screen reader users and other users when you have multiple links next to each other that go to the same place. If we think back to, say, like the, the switch, device. Some users with like severe disabilities, um, the, the one I listed, the person would be using their head to 
to hit the switch. And if you have like too many tab stops, it can cause fatigue. Also, if there's a bunch of links with the same text and they're just using assistive, assistive technology to look at like the links and they all say, click here, that can be confusing too because it doesn't provide context. Uh, though there are cases where you want adjacent elements on the page to link to the same page, and there's ways that you can do this, and I'll, I'll show that. So let's take a look at some bad examples again. So this one, before I turn on my screen reader, I noticed recently that they added this icon of a wheelchair icon that says enable accessibility mode. Um, I don't know what type of person adds an accessibility mode to their website and defaults it to off. But when you click it, it looks like it just adds the skip links as visible. Um, this is the only thing that I could tell that it did with a, a quick glance. And the other thing is that whenever you click it, it still moves focus to the search input. So if you are using a screen reader, you're not even going to know that those skip links are there because as you start tabbing, it, it goes through the page afterwards. So I'm going to turn on voice over, make sure I'm muted. I'll read out the important stuff. So here, if we can see, we're on pagination. But if you're using a screen reader, this says link two, link three, link four. So if you're using a screen reader, you might not know that this is pagination. It doesn't provide that context to you. That's something that we can, we can make better. Also, the add author alert buttons just say add author alert, and that's it. You don't know what author you're adding an alert for if you're going through the page. And I'm going to turn that off. Again, with the decorative images, I would consider these jacket covers decorative. If you're using a screen reader, it doesn't really matter um, that they're there or not because you get the same information from the title of the item. So here, they just say uh, link image, cover image for X-Files season five. That's, the link says link X-Files season five. It's the same thing. So it just adds an extra tab stop that could uh, cause fatigue for some users. Uh, another example, bestbuy.ca, which is different from bestbuy.com. Interesting engineering choice. Uh, on the Canada version, it has an issue if you search the jacket covers for the search results um, are informative. It looks like the alt text is like an image, like a, just like an ID. So the screen reader users will say link image forward slash m22220017 dot jpeg list 32 items. It's very confusing. Um, it's unnecessary. You can make this decorative, and you would just go through the search results, and it would say Twilight Zone Volume 2. That'd be much better. So let's look at a better example. Turn on my screen reader. Skip to content. I'm going to zoom out, actually, a little bit. There, OK. So here we've made the jacket covers decorative, and we're also hiding them from assistive technology and making them out of the tab order. So you don't tab to them, which is fine. And whenever you go to, say, place a hold button, it says place a hold, the testaments, audio, CD by Atwood, comma, Margaret. So each of these items is giving more context about what the link or button is. And then at the bottom, if I go through all these search results, you can see that the, the pagination, if you can see, it's pagination clearly. But if you can't and you're using a screen reader, they say go to page three, go to page four. So we're adding more context there for screen reader users. And I will, I'll give some examples for, for all of that. This one is for the duplicate links. So if you have an image and like a title, that are both going to go to the same place. You can just wrap them in the same link and make the image decorative. In this example, we make the image decorative by giving it alt equals empty string. And a screen reader will read this out like link 
heading level three, Pride and Prejudice. Sometimes you need to have HTML in between the other image and the title. So a neat trick that you can do there is you can use aria hidden, and this will hide it from assistive technology. And then you can add tab index equals minus one, and that will take it out of the tab order, which prevents, if you're using the tab key, it just bypasses it. So this will be ignored completely. And if you're using your keyboard, you'll get to this link, and it will say link heading level three, catch 22. Be careful with tab index. Uh, values greater than zero will, will hoist elements to the top of the navigation flow. So if you have them at like one, two, three, those items, no matter where they are on the page, are gonna be the first items that you tab to before anything else in the logical order, which is probably what was happening on that earlier example with the add author alert buttons. They probably had positive tab index values. And here, finally, if links have the same text, screen readers are gonna be missing context, so you can add visually hidden text. This is different than display none or visually hidden, where those CSS rules will hide that text from screen readers. This class, SR only, is something that's shipped with Bootstrap. Um, there's probably equivalents in most front-end frameworks. Basically kind of like clips the text and makes it hidden, but it's still there for screen readers, and they'll read them. So. The first example is just going to say link place hold. You're not gonna know what it's for. The second example will say link place hold on the color purple, which provides a lot more context. Headings, you're gonna to need to use a proper heading hierarchy on your pages. You can think of this as a table of contents. So if it makes sense to be in a table of contents, then you probably wanna make it a heading, otherwise make it a, a list or, or just a, a div or a paragraph or whatever. The semantics for headings, is what really matters to screen readers. It doesn't really matter how they're styled. So you can have different H2s and have them look differently. Um, let's look at some examples. So Chicago Public Library, their page looks like this. I'm going to use a Chrome extension web developer view document outline. And you can see that this is the the headings and the top navigation. Generally, you'd want the H1 to be the first item, but our accessibility people said if we're consistent with this, that it's okay. But we see Chicago Public Library homepage, homepage featured content, and these are all like content blocks um, and the H3s within them. Makes sense. For a bad example, let's look at H&M's website. It looks like this. It is fine. If we look at their heading hierarchy, the first thing is that they're, they're missing an H1. Every page needs to have an H1 and only one H1. Then they're missing an H2. Then they have a bunch of H3s where they're yelling at us. And we keep scrolling down to the bottom. There's a heading that doesn't have any text in it, which is confusing. And then this looks kind of weird, right? Um, I don't know what's going on here, so we can go back and take a look. We scroll down to the bottom. We see magazine, easing into fall, bring back the 80s, three ways to wear hound's tooth. If we look back here, if you're using, if you can't see the page and you're using assistive technology like a screen reader, you're gonna infer that shop, corporate info, help, and become a member are all sub items of three ways to wear hound's tooth. It's probably not the UX that they were going for. If we look at the page, those were the footer navigation headings. These should probably be H2s, and they probably just made them H4s because the default styling for the H4s was smaller, but you can just style an H2 to have smaller font size. Low vision, you're gonna have people who need to zoom your page, uh, the text in your page in order to read it. And there's two types of zoom. You can zoom text only, or you can zoom all of the content. It's also a digital curb cut. There's lots of situations where people zoom pages. Here we have two examples of staff lists, both zoomed at 200% text only zoom. One looks perfectly fine. The other one has text overlapping the image, and it's not because the image is on the bottom versus the top. What happens here is that one of these containers had a fixed height in pixels, which is a fixed unit. The other one has a fixed, uh, sorry, um, the height measured in rems, which is a relative unit. 
And if you zoom text, if you're using relative units on your container heights, they're going to adjust with, with your text zoom. Uh, you're also going to need to consider color contrast. Again, good color contrast is a digital curb cut. So when you're reading your phone outside on a sunny day, or some people probably can't even read this bottom one, but it says thin light gray fonts on a white background. It's very difficult to read. Here's an example, um, sorry, of the web aim co contrast checker. So this is one of our websites. This is on the footer. Um, browse staff picks, new titles, and more. This is the foreground color, dark gray. The background color is a lighter gray. The contrast ratio 4.09 to 1, which does not meet WCAG uh, level AA requirements, which would be 4.5 to 1 for, for regular wave text. But if we bolded it, um, it has different rules for bold text versus regular wave text, and it, it would have been fine. High contrast themes. Some users with low vision are going to use high contrast themes to view your site. These are going to look strange to you if you haven't seen them before, but for people who use them, uh, it's much easier for them to, to read your page. So let's look at an example. This is St. Louis Public Library's homepage. Looks fine. This is what it looks like in a high contrast theme. It's kind of really hard to see the, the purple on the side on the projector, but on a computer monitor, it does meet color contrast requirements. The main thing here is that everything is still here, right? So you can see the, the logo up here, regular text and borders and stuff like that's in yellow. Buttons are in white, links are in blue. All the images are displaying. You can just make sense of the page. Here's Apple, who has a reputation for their amazing design. Mid-2018, selling the iPhone X front and center. And this is what it looks like in high contrast. So their photography is completely absent. What they did was they implemented their image as a CSS background. And high contrast themes will correctly infer that CSS backgrounds are part of the background and not necessary to understand the page. So the hero banner on the St. Louis example is correctly using the image as an image tag. Uh, and then here we're using a, a CSS background image. It's really basic stuff, again, that you get for free when you use HTML and CSS as they're intended. Uh, question? Yes. Uh, the question was, is there a way to switch between the background image and the foreground image? There's probably a JavaScript solution, but you can't really detect whether you're in a high contrast theme or not with CSS. Um, actually, you, you, you can with CSS, but you can't with JavaScript necessarily. Um, but also, you could just use an image tag. Also, in this example, the navigation is missing for some reason. I, I don't know why that is, but that's also something that's a problem for them. Uh, another issue, high contrast themes are going to make your backgrounds consistent, so everything goes to black in this theme. There are other themes in, in Windows. Uh, to help remove clutter and to make the page easier to read. So sometimes background colors are used to group related page elements together. Color here is being used to separate the modal, which has a white background, from the, the stuff around it, which is sort of like grayed out, right? This is what it looks like in high contrast. It's a little bit confusing. Kind of looks like there's a paragraph just sort of stuck in the middle of the page that's beside the form elements for a name, and it's just sort of, it's like clipping it. There's a, a neat trick that you can use to help this. You can add a one pixel solid transparent border to the overlay, and the high contrast themes will pick that up and preserve that. And whenever you're not in a high contrast theme, it still just looks the same. So if you have overlays like this and you're graying out stuff behind it, you can add a one pixel solid transparent border and it will make it better for people who are using high contrast themes. Another aspect that's often overlooked is cognitive accessibility. Common examples of cognitive accessibility issues could be that icons that the user doesn't understand when the tab order on the page doesn't make sense, like in that earlier example, or if your target audience and the content reading level don't line up. 
Hemingway app is a tool that you can use to test the readability of your sentences or paragraphs or content. Often content writers will use this as their text editor. So we can take a look at that. I'll zoom a bit. It looks like this. It will give you recommendations um, about using passive voice or if your sentences are too complex. We can take a look at one of uh, Toronto Public Library's kids' blogs. So this is their kids' blog. It's one of their posts for getting a library card. I'll copy their text. And here it says grade three. So they did a really good job. Um, a kid is probably going to be able to understand this, and it gives a, a recommendation that maximum might be a difficult word for a kid to understand. One of our libraries has an accessibility FAQ that has a reading level of postgraduate. Uh, not very accessible, possibly written for lawyers. OK. Finally, how to build accessibility culture at your workplace. First, everybody needs training. Designers need to be aware of these color contrast guidelines, product managers, need to know and understand the engineering overhead required to build an accessible, auto-complete, multi-select input. Um, I don't know if one exists that's accessible. Developers aren't going to just know how to use a screen reader. It isn't the same as your tab key. Their screen readers have controls and shortcuts. They can read paragraphs. Um, I've had developers just tab through a page. They didn't know you could read paragraphs with voiceover or whatever. And it's also different for mobile devices where you don't have keyboards and they're gesture based or for like voice recognition software. At Biblio Commons, all the full stack developers take the online course Web Accessibility by Google, Developing with Empathy. I would recommend checking that out. It's free and it does a pretty good job of going into a little bit more detail about some of the stuff I'm talking about here. If you have access to front end masters, there's also a new course by Marcy Sutton called Accessibility in JavaScript Applications, which is also good. You got to test for accessibility. Automate what you can, and if you can afford it, hire real people or companies to do some of this for you, because none of us, um, well, I'm not an expert. I don't use assistive technology on a daily basis, so I can't really tell if something is going to work for everybody. So that's what these companies are for. If you can't afford that, your internal QA should be trained to the best of their abilities to do this. But unless they're using assistive technology on a daily basis, the results might vary. We work with a company called Level Access to get feedback. Hi. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're a great company. Um, they employ people with disabilities who test our features as we work on them and give us great feedback um, to help our features uh, be more accessible. We also have an internal accessibility dashboard for tracking accessibility metrics. Um, on my team, we run Pally against our builds. Um, there's a link to it here. It's open source. It's on GitHub. It's similar to the results you might get on the Wave tool. Note that tools like this, they're good for tracking uh, or catching like, low-hanging fruit or simple issues, like if an image is missing an alt attribute or if you don't have an H1 on your page. But they're not good at finding more complex like real issues where, say, an overlay pops up and you don't move focused within the overlay. Local accessibility communities. Many cities have these. Uh, they're great with training. There's so much that you can learn from your community. And it's important to listen to people with disabilities and to go to these meetups. And you, you, you'll learn a lot. St. Louis has a brand new one. Um, it's just starting. It's called St. Louis Digital Accessibility and Inclusive Design. There's a link to their meetup page here. It's, it's good for everybody. Product managers should go to these. UX, engineering, everybody. If you're from outside St. Louis, Meetup has a tag for web accessibility. And you can go there and see if there's one in your city. Pictured here is one of my coworkers. He's speaking on a panel at an accessibility conference in Toronto. Share your knowledge. As you go through this process, you're going to learn a lot. So make your accessibility knowledge accessible to other people that you work with. Document it. Coding best practices, design practices, processes, all of this can be documented. 
We've made a lot of improvements over the past years, and we use Confluence to document this. It's not public, but other companies have made their documentation public. So here's an example from eBay called Mind Patterns. We can take a quick look at this. Um, but yeah, they have a lot of their examples, like, like tabs. Um, I'd recommend checking this out. Here's an example from ours. This one's about forms. I didn't even talk about forms, um, but just to talk about this one quickly, uh, every form element needs a label. A placeholder is not sufficient. It's not going to be read out to screen readers. And also with placeholders, as soon as you start typing in them, it disappears. So if there's instructions, um, it's not valuable if, it, if they go away as soon as you start typing. If you really, really need to have a form input without a label, you can add a screen reader only label, um, at least. We also have a Slack channel for accessibility. We call it Guild Accessibility. It's great for asking for feedback from other coworkers, sharing resources, and general accessibility talk. So some, some closing thoughts. Accessible patterns benefit everybody, but they're essential for people that need them the most. Accessibility is about more than just screen readers. And show some damn empathy. This has an effect on real people. Thank you.